Nickelodeon is one of those fan-favorite lost media categories that has a lot of nostalgic attachment to it. And recently, we've seen quite a lot of content from the company get found. From the Super Y pilot to the humpback hop and even behind closed doors, you never know what or how new lost media is going to show up. But more often than not, all of these are archived digitally, and even in the case of behind closed doors, I never received the physical book and only got pictures of it. So I don't search for Nickelodeon stuff that often on eBay because of that fact. But sometimes I will, hoping to find something like a Me and My Friends tape or print material that has remained undocumented online. And it was during one of these searches that I did find a treasure. It was called Nickelodeon Animation Employee Yearbook 1998 and featured old school artwork of classic Nick characters all together on a hard front and back cover. We could even see a few of the inside pages from the auction that show its contents, like how many series the book covers, creator write-ups, and a collage of office pictures. I had never even seen anything like this at the time, and thought the topic was so interesting that I might buy the book for a video and document it for the first time. However, it was something I put on the back burner several times, and eventually decided to tweet about it thinking that maybe someone else had already documented it online, and I just couldn't find a copy of it. It seems like a couple others had sold in the past, so this was a possibility. But what ended up happening was instead of an archived copy being shared, someone bought the book that I had tweeted about, and it never resurfaced again. I really felt like I had dropped the ball on this one, purposely telling people about a treasure I had found. Now, not only would I not be able to make a video about it, but I didn't even have a way to see what was in it for myself. Well, it's as they say, when one domino falls, the rest will follow. I've noticed a pattern with rare items that once one of them sells and shows a clear demand for it, more get listed by people who want to sell it while it's hot. This happened for both my King of Fighters Terry doll, which hardly existed before I bought mine, and my new Epoch Kasumi doll, which I imported from Japan, after a few collectors told me it was impossible to find even back when it released. In both of these cases, several items of each have shown up since I first bought these ones. And with this Nickelodeon yearbook, it seems that when the first one sold, it prompted another one to go up, and I caught it, knowing I would buy it if given another opportunity. A couple weeks after I lost the original copy with that tweet, I gained another copy of my own, the never-before-seen Nickelodeon 1998 yearbook. And today, I'd like to archive this piece of lost media and Nickelodeon history. However, before we start with the book itself, I have a little appetizer that was included with my copy. I was able to confirm that the person I bought the book from was actually someone who worked on putting it together, and stayed with Nickelodeon for around a decade after its creation. As a result, I was sent an employee newsletter, fittingly called Splat News, for August and September 2000, headlining some developments at the company at the time. This would have been a couple years after the yearbook was published, but it too contains some awesome Nickelodeon memories and articles written by those who were there. The cover features the Splat logo, with a special credit to Andy Suriano for designing the new Splat logo. This is Volume 2, Issue 2, so this must be the first one to use the new logo, and previous releases must have looked different. The headline here is Nickelodeon's Studio Staff Meeting, where the crew of the animation teams gathered to discuss the current state of animation and how the studio is dealing with that change. At the event, it mentioned that a collection of clips from the upcoming shows were viewed by all, and overall left a positive note with the staff, as General Manager Mark Taylor made a comment about Nickelodeon's direction, stating, At the end of the year, I anticipate the studio will be full and in full production, mentioning that Dora the Explorer, Oswald, and Spongebob will be leading the charge, on top of Hey Arnold and Catdog TV movies being in the works. It's crazy to be taken back to an era where Dora and Oswald hadn't even been on TV yet. But the funniest takeaway from this article is Kevin Kay, president of Paramount Networks, who commented that Spongebob is currently kicking Pokemon's ass. It concludes by mentioning celebrities that made the cut to be included in upcoming projects, and new classes that will teach a variety of programs like Flash and Photoshop. Flipping to the inside, the next two pages highlight some of the upcoming projects that were mentioned at the meeting, and give us some comments about each one. The full lineup includes Hey Arnold, Dora, The Fairly Odd Parents, Oswald, SpongeBob, and Invader Zim. 
There are many interesting pieces of information mentioned in these sections, starting with Hey Arnold, that states, Arnold Saves the Neighborhood has finished production, but it is hopeful that a theatrical movie following Arnold's search for his parents gets greenlit in the future. This is actually a reference to the original Hey Arnold the Jungle movie from 2002, that started production and was supposed to be released, but cancelled before its release in 2004, when creator Craig Bartlett left Nickelodeon. As for the Fairly Odd Parents, this was before the cartoon even aired, so it's mentioned that the rumors are true, and that the series was poofed up for a 7 episode script pickup. It also mentions that Frankie Muniz and Jay Leno are on board as voice talent, referencing that mention of celebrities from the staff meeting. Only one half hour of content had been shipped when this was written. Now we have to look at the Spongebob section, though in 2000 the show was already airing. It mentions that they will finish their first season 2 episode on August 4th, but that Spongebob did appear at the 4th of July Cayucos Parade in the form of a float made from recycled boogie boards. It's too bad there's no picture included here, that would have been cool to see, so I guess it's lost media. Additionally, Oswald was picked up for 26 episodes, Dora tells Barney to move over and tell a bye-bye to the Teletubbies, and Invader Zim says that scripts are being written, voices are being recorded, and interns are being whipped, all with hilarious results, in a very clearly joking way. The final section inside of this newsletter discusses the scripting process of Invader Zim, and talks about how they wanted to make a show that contradicts a cartoon like Rugrats. The example they use is an episode where Zim steals human organs, which actually did happen, despite Nickelodeon giving the team notes that say stuff like, don't vaporize the main character's head, and please add more talking babies, after submitting their scripts for review. And finally, to conclude the newsletter, is what's on the back, which is titled Nickelodeon's Biker Heaven, and highlights the crew members that are active members of the motorcycle community. There's a list of frequently asked questions, and some of their responses include answers to picking up chicks or dudes, and family and friends concerns. Storyboard artist Joe Daniello's responses are pretty funny, answering the family concerns question with, They say I can do whatever I want, so long as I use protection. Thanks, Mom. And Mike Sivako, saying that compared to the action Joe gets when it comes to picking up chicks, he's just doing okay. At the bottom is an August and September 2000 calendar, which shows meetings, classes, and lunch options. It kind of reminds me of being back in middle school. There's a lot of flash classes on here, and life drawing, as well as in an out burger being a favorite of the studio. But now it's time for the main event, the actual Nickelodeon Studios animation yearbook from 1998, the place to be, according to the front cover. Both front and back feature a hard cover like I mentioned before, and a collection of characters. It seems like the artwork chosen for each character is pretty final looking, with the exception of the Spongebob ones, who have weird coloring or thick outlines that look like they were taken from a piece of concept art. As we'll soon discover, Spongebob hadn't even premiered when this book was published, so there's a lot of early content seen within. Interestingly, the Oh Yeah Cartoons logo can also be seen in the front, rather than having chosen any characters to represent it, though the cover holds even more secrets. It's been said that both covers can be viewed in 3D, by using a pair of paper 3D glasses included on the inside cover, and it actually kinda works. There's definitely some depth to it. With that said, let's open to the first page where we're greeted by a letter from Mark Taylor, Vice President and General Manager of Nickelodeon. He begins by recollecting the proposition, construction, and move into the new Nickelodeon Studios building which feels like it's always been home to the staff, and surprises new visitors by how cool of a place it really is. Mark further mentions how the staff has made the place feel so loved, and lists off some of the accolades of the past year, including Angry Beavers taking home a batch of new awards, CatDog premieres as the first Nickelodeon strip series to high ratings, Hey Arnold succeeding in its time slot, the Oya oh yeah Cartoons pilot program being a huge success, and Spongebob launching to the delight of millions of kids. Finally, referencing the yearbook itself, and how much of a joy it was to help in putting it together. And now for the main event, the table of contents and all that the book has to offer. There are quite a few different shows that are covered here, including Hey Arnold, The Angry Beavers, Cat Dog, Oh Yeah Cartoons, which features many different shows in itself, Spongebob and Nickflix, with an early logo of the Electric Piper, a former piece of lost media that the community ended up finding. There's also an administration page and lots of cool pictures of the studio. But first, the disclaimer. 
Throughout the book, there is a lot of funny commentary and jokes from staff, and this is the first one. Basically saying that the book was well researched and authenticated, before saying that none of it was researched and may be incorrect. Additionally, the book can be damaged if you intentionally throw it into a fire or place a hand grenade under it, so it asks to keep the book in a safe place. But the first couple pages of main content are really cool to see documented here. It's the construction of the actual building where all your favorite Nickelodeon cartoons were created, complete with a joke about how they first had to remove all the torture devices that were left by the old tenants. Then construction could properly begin, followed by a progression of photos showing the framework, exterior, and interior of the building, with funny captions of their own. These constantly poke fun at Disney and reference anti-Disney sensors and stench-proof walls in case Disney tries to penetrate Nickelodeon Studios. Then the exterior and interior get furnished with statues and classic orange decor, with one shot mentioning that the Viacom cheese wall was the result of cutting costs to reuse building materials. I wonder how much of a joke that one actually is. And on the next page we get to our first show, Hey Arnold, with creator Craig Bartlett and artwork of Arnold at the top. These write-ups discuss a lot about the crew behind the show, but also contain some facts and trivia about it. Here is a biography for Craig, describing him as one of the most approachable executive producers in all of television, along with being easygoing and friendly. Below is a wide shot of the classroom background used in the show. This is followed by layout supervisor Brian Mark, composer Hugh McDonald, and background artist Kenji Notani. There's a little bit written about their background as well, and some personality traits too. But I think one of the coolest parts about seeing photos like this is how a lot of them look like they were taken on the spot, as if someone walked in with a camera during their work and took a picture. You can see the lanyards around their neck, the sometimes messy backgrounds of their desks, and fun vibes. It gives you a little snapshot of life at Nickelodeon Studios, and how much creativity these people had in making their cartoons. The Hey Arnold section ends with a piece titled Nicktoons Inquirer, and every cartoon has a section similar to this. It pokes fun or expands upon some of the culture set up in each cartoon, with this one talking about Helga and Arnold's secret relationship. Fueling rumors of their on-screen romantic tension, these surveillance photos were taken at a remote Swiss retreat. Many say these are their honeymoon photos Nicktoons doesn't want you to see. There's even a notice at the bottom that says, To obtain the juicier pics, please send $5 in cash in unmarked bills and a self-addressed stamped envelope to Nicktoons Studios and allow six to eight weeks for delivery. This is likely another crew joke, but I can't help but wonder if someone actually drew up spicy pictures for this. What if someone actually sent them money? Would they be sent anything? And is there a time limit on this offer? Can we uncover some lost pictures of Arnold and Helga? To the left are some traits about Arnold himself, comparing him to a football, though Arnold ends up winning 4-1 in the end, after it's decided that Arnold viewers will grow up to be productive members of society and that Arnold has an international reach, while American football is exclusive to the US and is made out of a dead pig skin handled by sweaty men. In between some of the sections are these cool autograph pages that look like they were part of an actual contest that was held. It says that whoever acquires the most signatures by April 30th, 1999 will receive a $25 gift certificate to the Nickelodeon store. There was also a mystery signature that came with a special prize but as far as I could tell, there is no mention of who that mystery person was. And unfortunately, my book doesn't have any autographs in it at all, and I wonder how many of them actually did. I would have lost my mind if there was a hidden Steven Hillenburg signature somewhere in here, but given the pristine quality of this book, it seems like it was well preserved and never actually used. Next up is The Angry Beavers, which introduces the series by talking about creator Mitch Schauer and his design process in creating the beavers. Dogs and cats weren't going to be original enough for a cartoon, and mice were out as well, to prevent copying the competition, that being Mickey and Disney. The conclusion was reached to focus on beavers after realizing that nobody's done a cartoon about beavers before, and that beavers do nothing. This led to the conflict of beaver versus beaver, and where the series got its start from. Unfortunately, I was hoping there would be some mention of Cuff Together in here, the rumored second pilot for the series that some people claim exists, but nothing that early in production is even mentioned. The Beaver vs. page is earlier on in this section too, pitting the brothers against each other. Norbert wins in a huge 5.5 to 0.5 defeat for Daggett, 
and only because in the best name section, when called a beaver, there is no question that they are indeed beavers. It definitely seems like there's some favoritism going on, allowing Norbert to break the rules, and calling Daggett out for allegedly cheating on some of the stats. Similar to Hey Arnold, there are crew pages that follow the team who helped put out the show, and another background shot is used on this page, showing a lake with some trees in the back. Following the beavers is another transition page that shows some of the Nicktoons characters before they were stars on TV, and contains uniquely drawn artwork done in black and white. This is accompanied by another signature page on the other side. It seems like you were intended to collect signatures from the crew of each cartoon within their own respective sections, rather than one group autograph page. But now is one of my favorite pages in the whole book, a huge two-page search and find game that is drawn as an original piece of art, containing a plethora of individual drawings of the cast, crew, and of course, Nicktoons themselves. It asks you to find Mark Taylor, and as you look through the piece, you can find all kinds of easter eggs and cameos, even from shows that don't appear in the book at all, like Red and Stimpy, Rocco's Modern Life, and Ah Real Monsters. Spongebob characters even make some appearances in the top left corner. There's another game too on the next page, a crossword puzzle, using Nicktoons references and a lot of stuff that I'm actually not familiar with. I wonder if some of these are inside jokes that only the staff would know. Cat Dog shows up next, and includes a little poem underneath the picture of Peter Hannon, who got his start illustrating for newspapers and magazines, drawing inspiration from his cat Scat and childhood dog Tipper for the show, which he said was a mind-expanding experience. To the right are his staff, with a background portion of the town seen in the show beneath. Of course, Cat Dog are pitted against themselves, with Cat coming out on top 3 to 1. But I really like the page that features an entire breakdown of the Cat Dog house. This is the kind of specific commentary that you don't often see on a piece from the show. It showcases some of the features on the exterior of their house, including the chimney that is fitted precisely for Santa Claus, but is too small for the Grinch. They also have a Martha Stewart inspired patio set, and a hydrant that is used as a guest bathroom. Now if you enjoyed the other two games, here's a third one you can play, a classic word search. You can actually pause the screen and try to fill this out if you wanted, though I can't help but think maybe some of these words listed don't actually appear in the word search at all. That would be a very Nickelodeon joke to play in my opinion. Now, we get a break from the shows already in production, and take a step into the world of Oh Yeah Cartoons, which is another one of my favorite sections in the book. Oh Yeah Cartoons was a pilot program headed by Fred Seibert that gave life to many popular Nicktoons, including The Fairly Odd Parents, Chalk Zone, and My Life as a Teenage Robot. While the latter two aren't mentioned in this book at all, many Oh Yeah cartoons are still featured in it, some that have become fan favorites and some by well-known creators. The first page is home to The Fairly Odd Parents, and features some early concept art of the three main characters. A younger Butch Hartman also appears next to the description of the show, though curiously, the artwork on the side doesn't match up with the creator and description itself. At first I thought this mix-up was an accident, but it's formatted like that on both of these pages, so maybe it was an intentional joke. The Feelers by Bill Burnett, creator of Chalk Zone, is also on this page, but despite the Chalk Zone pilot being created in 1998, that doesn't appear in the book at all. The next batch of pilots feature a couple notable additions. Firstly, Twin Crimson, a classic Oya cartoon that was unfortunately never picked up for its own series, and Zoomates, which was created by Seth MacFarlane. Unfortunately, there was no yearbook photo of Seth in here, which would have been fun to see. On the next page is a cartoon from Rob Renzetti called Hubkins and Sweetie Pie. While this cartoon did not get picked up for a full series either, Rob would later go on to create My Life as a Teenage Robot, which got its pilot made in 1999. So even though both Chalk Zone and Teenage Robot don't appear in the book, it's cool they kind of show up in spirit anyway. I also recognize Pat Ventura from some of the pitches he made for Cartoon Network's What a Cartoon Pilot program. Then there are a few other shows in here that I haven't heard too much about, with the exception of Super Santa, who even appears in one of the TV promos for Oh Yeah Cartoons. Think you can be like these artists and have the skills to work on your own cartoon at Nickelodeon? Well in 1998 you could have applied for an internship, with this full page ad scouting for new talent. I don't know how hard it is to get a job at Nickelodeon nowadays, but I can only guess how much easier it was 25 years ago before all the competition. And now for the big one, 
the show pages that are dedicated to SpongeBob SquarePants and the crew behind it. Keep in mind, this book was published in 1998, which was a year before SpongeBob aired, so nobody knew just how popular the show would eventually become. Steven Hillenburg appears alongside a write-up about his career, working on Rocco's modern life and his love for science, having graduated in 1992 with a degree in experimental animation. It even mentions his two independent films, The Green Beret and Wormholes, both of which were exhibited internationally and can be found on YouTube today. Unfortunately, there is no mention of the Intertitled Zone comic that was made prior to Spongebob. But speaking of Spongebob, the little yellow guy gets a whole page dedicated to him, with an interesting note that the B in Bob constantly changes between capital and lowercase, either by mistake or because it was not yet established which spelling was technically correct. It goes on to describe Spongebob as a hero who lives in a fully furnished pineapple and has a dream to become employee of the month at the Krusty Krab, with hobbies that include jellyfishing, bubble art, and playing the conch, though his potential for disaster looms large. There are also two pieces of background art for this section, Goo Lagoon and the inside of the Krusty Krab at sunset after it's closed, a pretty rare sight in general for Krusty Krab art pieces. In this head-to-head -head section, Spongebob is compared to a generic sponge, which is also described as being evil. Surprisingly, it's not a clean sweep for Spongebob, as he loses one point to the generic sponge in fashion sense. Apparently the generic sponge got the point for always being in the buff. There's actually not too much funny show humor here, unlike the other cartoons, maybe because the character wasn't too established yet. Tom Yasumi gets a little bio, along with several other recognizable crew members from the show, and the section concludes with an aquarium caricature shot of the crew drawn like fishes. Each cartoon section actually had an original art piece drawn for it, but the SpongeBob one is by far the most detailed and colorful. Finally, the last section listed in the table of contents before the bonus pages is a preview for Nickflix, which details two of the first directed TV movies being produced under the program, one called Around the World in 80 Days which features an all-animal cast, and of course the famous Electric Piper, previously called the Pied Piper in this early piece of artwork from before the title was finalized. This movie is best known for having been aired very briefly on Nickelodeon in the early 2000s, before becoming lost for years after that, with a full search for a copy having been conducted in the community. Interestingly, it says that both of these two projects will be in Blockbuster stores next year, but I don't think the Electric Piper ever got any kind of home media release at all. It looks like Around the World in 80 Days did air on Nickelodeon in 2002 and was released onto home media, which can still be bought from Amazon. Following the conclusion of the main table of contents are a series of bonus pages that contain a variety of different content and artwork. I guess as most yearbooks go, they have to be made prior to release. So even though this is documenting 1998 in the studio, it was released in 1999 according to this fact chart. Some of these I hadn't even heard about before, but it's too bad there's no mention of some of the earliest lost media from the channel, like pinwheel content. And since this was released in 1999, it pokes fun at some of the upcoming events that might take place in the new millennium, featuring Hey Arnold artwork to showcase Stinky's predictions for the future, including the oceans rising in 2006, kids cleaning oil spills in 2015, ugly kids in 2054, and pollution problems in 2091. If it weren't for the captions with these drawings, a lot of the depictions themselves are eerily accurate of current events. Not listed in the table of contents, but what could be considered a bonus feature are some upcoming projects that the studio is working on, including Bone, which ended up becoming a cancelled film altogether. A deal was signed in 1998 with Paramount Pictures and Nickelodeon to produce the movie, with pre-production starting in 2000. But eventually, creative differences ended up causing the film to be cancelled later that year. This page also mentions the rights to a book series called Hank the Corn Dog, but I couldn't find anything about a show like that. There is concept art at the bottom of the page that shows a dog on a ranch, as is mentioned in the description, so I searched for the book instead of the Nickelodeon movie, and discovered it's called Hank the Cow Dog, not Corn Dog. But even after looking for this production with its real title, nothing came up, so it must have been cancelled early in production, and this piece of concept art is probably one of the only pieces of content that exists from it. There's also an early production image from Invader Zim, 
a Crow cartoon that looks like the Crowville Chronicles, but that pilot is too old to be in this section of the book, and then a preview of an upcoming Oya oh yeah cartoon titled Planet Kate by creator Jamie Mitchell, which did not end up being picked up for a full series. After the rest of the animation content is a page of random facts, which are really random. Only the first one has to do with Nickelodeon, and the rest are followed by some executives with original caricature art. Then there are even more random facts, some of which mention Nickelodeon shows, but most do not. And then finally, is a page dedicated to some new shapes for the Nickelodeon logo, said to be created from a mixture of orange juice and copy toner. Some of these I've definitely seen before. Dogface is a pretty classic shape. In the back are some more autograph pages, which again, mine unfortunately does not have any, and then are more inside photos of a completed Nickelodeon Studios at night, and with the lights on. The book concludes with ads for companies that Nickelodeon has probably used before, including Iron Mountain Archival Services, Cartoon Color Animation Supplies Company, and Sitchell Jacket Manufacturers, who claim to have made Angry Beavers, Nickelodeon, and Hey Arnold Jackets. Surprisingly, you actually can find some of these in the wild, and this one actually has Dogface on it, though most of these are probably not items that you could easily find nowadays. There are even more autograph pages in the back, and then the book concludes with another Nickelodeon logo. This was an amazing book to get to flip through, and it really takes you back to the earlier days of Nickelodeon, before most of their popular shows were even on the air yet. Not only to see the people behind the cartoons, but the fact that a book like this even exists at all, to document the past. I've seen more modern yearbooks that are done in the same style, but I'm not sure if any other ones from around this era were made. It's also incredible to see that copies still exist, and have been put out into the wild at all. Otherwise, this item is something that could have easily been forgotten about. Even though we can't go back to experience Nick and what the staff did at the studio, or even relive those days on TV that so many people consider to be their childhood, pieces like this remind us about how far Nickelodeon has actually come, and in doing that, it makes the past feel a little closer to us. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to check out some of my other Lost Media videos. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Finn.